Okay, so we are going to start chapter 11. Uh, so by chapter 10, we have finished uh, the major statistical theory, the estimation method and hypothesis testing method. And today we have only like two more chapters, chapter 11 and 12. Um, and so th these last two chapters are devoted to the linear regression model, which is the most important uh, method in applied uh, economics. So uh, this chapter is more like a preliminary prerequisite for the last chapter, which is the main uh, hero of this uh, course. So let me start. <clears throat> so remember, in chapter 3 and chapter 4, we learned some important measures of a random variable. At the time, we learned uh, mean and median as measures of location or measures of central tendency. Also, we learned variance, range, standard deviation as measures of variability or measures of dispersion. So, those measures are some kind of summary. They summarize the shape of one a uh, random variable. But now, what we are going to do here is we will study the relationship between multiple variables, in particular, two variables for now, and the following chapter will handle a uh, multiple variable case. So, two keywords in our chapter, in this chapter, is uh, the covariance and the correlation coefficient. And the next chapter, uh, the regression is the main keyword. So, uh, whichever textbook you use, you can just use these two keywords, covariance, correlation coefficient, then any textbook should have these two keywords in their index. So, you can find a lot of uh, materials, readings online or any from any textbook about them. Okay, let me start. So let me start with uh, real data. It's real data, right? Uh, so this data is about climate and economy. So in our data set, 183 countries are observed and we observe their average yearly temperature, average oh, like over a year uh, between like these 30 years. So average temperature in measured in Celsius, degrees in Celsius. And also we have 2005 GDP per capita in US dollars, right? It's a real data. So I, I took it from uh, this website, which is a economic forum uh, in 20, 2020, 12. Uh, and, and from the data, I could just to list a few, I see these uh, countries at the top of the GDP per capita. Qatar is the highest, has the highest GDP per capita, and Luxembourg, Macau, Singapore, Kuwait uh, top the list of GDP per capita. And also we observe their average temperature. Qatar, Macau, Singapore, Kuwait are like hot countries. Like their average temperature is above 20 degrees. But relatively, Luxembourg has a temperature lower than 10 degrees. Uh, so uh, you can see. I am wondering. So what we want to see, what we want to see here is, is there any relationship? What kind of relationship is there between the average temperature and the GDP per capita? Is there any tendency? For example, I wonder. You may think warmer countries better off, or the other way, colder countries tend to uh, have a higher GDP. There might be some relationship between them. So we are considering how to, we, we will learn how to quantify this correlation, their relationship. Okay, the first thing to do uh, from the data is making a scatter plot. You know what is a scatter plot? It is to place the observations on two-dimensional plane, 
right? So these two dimension two dimensional plane x axis, the horizontal axis captures the average temperature in Celsius, and the vertical axis y axis captures the GDP per capita, and then each country becomes one uh, dot. Like for example, Canada is here. Canada has a very low average temperature, so it's like negative, like minus, nearly minus six. Canada and Russia have very low average temperature, as you know. So they are located here, but Canada's GDP is above 30,000, and Russia's GDP is ab about 15,000, according to our data. So they are located, Canada is located here, Russia is located here. Qatar is located here. Qatar has very high average temperature, but at the same time, very high uh, GDP per capita. Qatar, Macau, Singapore, uh, we observe them. And Luxembourg has higher, high, very high GDP per capita, but uh, average temperature is around 9, 9 degrees, like similar to that of the United States, right? So in this way, there are a lot of dots on the plot. So, and you can understand one dot is a country and the location of the dot is the, the size of the, 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 the temperature that's determined by the average temperature and the GDP per capita. So from this plot, you can tell a lot of countries are here, right? Maybe poor countries uh, near the equator are located here, uh, and some cold countries. There are only like like one more country has uh, temperature below zero, average temperature below zero. And in this way, you can see how the countries are distributed on two-dimensional space, two-dimensional plane. So it extends one-dimensional graph into uh, two-dimensional plot. So, and additionally, we can see what we want here is the trend. We want to answer these questions. Do colder countries have higher GDP on average? Or we would like to answer how strong is that relationship? Is there any like clear pattern between the climate and the economy? So I'm going to call the first question as the about is about the direction, the direction of that relationship, and the second question is also it's about the strength of the relationship, how strong the relationship uh, is, and these both questions, these two questions, are basically summarized by a trend line. So technically, like on the graph. What we want here is we want to draw this kind of trend line that go through the middle of the uh, dots. So later we will explain, we learn, we will learn how to draw this trend line in the next chapter. Regression is basically how to find the trend line here. But for now, I'm just, I'm just going to assume that there is a trend line. So you you can draw a straight line that best fit those dots. It go through the center middle of all the middle middle of the dots, and then as you see, the line is downward sloping. It's going down. That means as the temperature increases, the trend in the GDP per capita is going down. The higher the temperature the lower the GDP per capita. That's captured by the trend line, right? So that's about the direction. And the strength is the deviation from the trend line. How, how much, uh, like for example, Qatar has very weak, it's a weak relationship between, uh, like, for, like deviates a lot from the trend line. So the trend line tells you the higher the temperature, the lower the GDP per capita but Qatar is going the other way. It has very hot weather, but has the highest GDP per capita. So 
uh, strength is about uh, deviations. How how the how the trend line can how how good the trend line uh, in explaining those pattern. Okay. So uh, by the way, P four starting the serious analysis and more uh, quantitative approach. We are going. I'm going to disclaim the limitation of this analysis. So we will restrict our focus on uh, the linear relationship. So we will only consider trend that is linear, that is a straight line, like this. So in this example, trend is super clear that it is a straight line. But in this example, in this uh, like bottom left graph, Clearly, there is a nonlinear, like a, like going down and then going up, like U-shaped relationship. So in this case, the relationship is not linear. So we are going to not consider this kind of thing. This kind of example is excluded in our analysis. Or in this case, it's linear here, like flat and then up. Maybe the first part, lower part is linear and the second part is also linear but their slopes are different in this case also in overall the linear the relationship is not linear so these two are examples of nonlinear relationship like where the slope changes so uh, I claim that we will not consider these kind of uh, counter examples Everything we consider in our uh, in this chapter is assumed to have a linear relationship, right? Otherwise, uh, we need more techniques. So that's beyond the scope of this course. So I'll I'll not discuss that. Okay. Then say then given the linear relationship, there are only th two directions. Actually, three three possible directions of the relationship. One is going down. The straight line goes down. Downward sloping line or upward sloping line. And in this case, this is a special case where there is no clear line or the line is flat. In this case, the direction is zero, neither negative nor positive. So we call this downward sloping uh, relationship as negative and this as positive because if the line is downward sloping, that means when x increases, y tends to decrease. So their tendency goes the other way. So we call this negative, uh, this pattern as the negative direction. And in this case, the higher the x, the higher x is, the larger y is, in the average, on average. So it's positive. But in this case, when x increases there is no tendency in Y at all. It's just flat, around 4. So in this case, the relationship is 0. There is no relationship. So these three are all possible directions we can imagine in a linear relationship. And then in terms of strength, we can think about these, we can compare these two things. So. Both, in both cases, both examples, the direction is positive. Trend line is going up. But their difference, difference between these two graphs is how tight the observations are toward the trend line. <coughs> Definitely, this trend on the right graph, the trend is more clear. The pattern is much more clear. So we call that the relationship is strong. But on the left, the strength it's weaker. The, rela the relationship is weak. The trend is weak because there are more deviations. Even if there is trend, but there are more like exceptions to that uh, trend. So in that, so this is how we uh, what we how we define the strength of the relationship. So again, the direction and the strength. These two are the main. Uh, questions, main, main things we would like to quantify in this chapter. 
and then so then the starting point here is fixing the center we will fix the center at the the averages so so in this scatter plot suppose that the average center is here and then what we are going to do here is we will look at their directions first the direction i mean in the idea is so from the center the average once you choose the center what happens if x increases from the center so when x increases it goes to the right and then when when x goes to the right are like does y go up or go down from the from its mean so right again mean of x is here the vertical line x x axis is here so the mean of x is 4 and what happens if x changes from 4 to 5 for example at 5 the average of y increases or decreases in this graph some y's are below its average but there are more observations above the average of y so in this way to the to the right is larger x to the left is smaller x above is larger y and below is smaller y so you can define four quadrants based on like split uh, around the average the average becomes the reference point base point and then from there divide the observations into four quadrants and then you can see the first quadrant has observations both greater than their averages and the third quadrant have uh, observations that are both smaller than their averages so then the first and the third quadrants imply positive relationship because when x, x increased y increased and either x decreased y decreased so both increased or both decreased from their averages that is those observations lie in the first or the third quadrant you get it so we will define the direction whether it increased or decreased uh, based on their average and from the average the first quadrant and the third quadrant capture positive relationship moving in the same direction then automatically the other quadrants the second and the fourth quadrants are the observations that x and y move in the opposite direction for example here bottom right bottom right quadrant has uh, observations that has x is greater than its mean but y is smaller than its mean so x increased but y decreased on the other side fourth quadrant x decreased y increased so these two quadrants have uh, the negative relationship right so they are uh, negative they, they represent negative relationship uh, from the graph right so then how to how do we quantify that so you know we, a simple way to tell whether it is on this side or the other side is to see the sign of the TV the product of deviations so this is the deviation in X this is the deviation in Y if they move together both must have the same sign either plus plus or minus minus then anyhow in either case their multiplication will be positive but if the deviations are in the opposite direction then their multiplication will result in a negative number right so so as you can see uh, the third and the first and the third quadrants will result in a positive cross product of deviations but the other the second and the fourth quadrants will result in uh, will give a negative cross product of deviations we are going to use these signs to quantify the overall relationship so if all the observations are in one quadrant 
in or in one has only one sign from their cross product, then it would be very simple to tell the direction. However, in as you can see from this picture graph, some are on the first and third quadrant, but others are on the other sign. So it's still it's unclear what's more dominating. We have to find which sign is dominating the other. So that is the covariance. We will so the simple way to determine the overall sign is to take the average. So calculate these cross products for each observation and then and then uh, sum take the summation. And if the summation is positive, then we will determine the overall relationship is positive. If the summation is negative, then we will say the relationship is negative. That idea is reflected in the formula for the covariance. So covariance is the average of the cross products of deviations. Exactly that's what I just explained. So cross product of deviations capture the direction of the relationship uh, and we are taking just average of that to determine the overall average direction, right? So, uh, and as we define the sample variance and the population variance formulas in chapter 4, we can think about sample covariance and uh, population covariance formulas here. Like sample covariance is defined in this way. So this is so deviation of x, deviation of y, and then multiply them, and then sum them and divide by the sample size. Sum and divide by sample size is taking the average, but not just divide by the sample size, but divide by the sample size minus 1. That's the sample covariance formula, which is unbiased. Right? We learned uh, sample variance is unbiased, but if you use n here, n in the denominator, then that will be biased. So that's why we are using n minus 1. So anyhow, both are used in practice, but usually the sample covariance is you know, like more common. I cannot say population formula is wrong. By the way, you may compare the similarity between the covariance and the variance. So in an extreme case where y equals x, say, suppose y equals x, then this part, the multiplication, the cross product simply becomes square, multiplying the same thing. So then it becomes x deviation squared, which is, which results in the variance of x. So you may understand the variance is a special case of the covariance when you calculate the covariance between the same, same variables, right? You calculate covariance between x and y, but if y and x happen to be the same guys, then uh, that becomes the variance. Okay, so yeah, this was uh, an introduction to the covariance, and in the next video, I'm going to give you numerical example, a uh, simplified numerical example uh, using the climate and economy example, uh, and we will practice how to calculate the covariance. Okay, see you there. Bye.